I'm excited to preach this message. You know, it's funny. One of my family members, uh, you know, this morning says, can't you just, can't you just be careful? You know, I want to make sure you're on the right side of history. <laughs> so it was a rough morning for me because uh, how many know it's probably the wrong thing to say to me on Pentecost Sunday? I was already fired up. And I said, so-and-so, mom, the only wrong side of history will be if I'm not on the alignment with Christ. If I'm in alignment with Christ and the word of God, I'm gonna be on the right side of history no matter what the world is doing. So listen, take courage. However society shifts, we should not waver. We just be in alignment with the word of God revealed by his word, which is truth. We're gonna be on the right side of history every single time. So I don't wanna get caught up in the world, what the world says history is gonna be. Just drives me crazy. But, you know, on this Pentecost Sunday, I was thinking about it. This is when the church over 2,000 years ago was started. And I'm gonna read and I'm gonna do a little teaching around it, but it reminded me, I didn't know why I was thinking about this. I had all these thoughts about how I went to grad school in San Francisco. And I would go down, I'd go into the city and, and uh, there's this one guy on Pier 39, and he, it, you know, is the no motion man, the motionless man, and he'd be there. And there's a sign that says, "100 bucks if you can get him to laugh, smile, anything. If you could get him to break character, it said you get 100 bucks." <laughs> so I'm like, I'm up for a good challenge. Three hours later, you know, I was trying to do everything: funny joke, funny face. And then I, I wasn't the only one. I mean, there was, I mean, I learned some of my best jokes that day. I mean, we were trying everything to get this guy to crack character. He was always at pure. Wow, wow, here we go. We must be upsetting the devil today. I haven't even got to the good stuff yet. But the motionless man is what he named himself, coined himself, and he always stood there in Pier 39, and I would go down there week after week trying to get this guy to laugh for 100 bucks. I needed the money. But the only one that left there broke was me. Never got that 100 bucks. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records today. And literally, he would be there as the motionless man stood perfectly still. And I thought, in fact, it's so amazing that they hired him to stand at Union Square sometimes in front of Bloomingdale's or some of the stores because he was better than some of the mannequins. And what would really mess people up is when he changed positions. You would just lose your mind because then he'd be frozen in that position for like an hour. And what I thought about, I'm like, why am I thinking about this now? And I think it's because today as a pastor, even though I look back when I met that guy, I was so impressed by him. It reminded me a lot of the churches I know. Many congregations seem today have mastered the fine art of almost doing nothing. And I don't mean to be offensive because I grew up in that. And I look to see what we've done in missions or in that video or all these campuses. I want to let you know it's because of the volunteers that we have in this church. It's because of the heart when people get in alignment that they want to serve. They get a desire on the inside. I remember I went to church. I took from church. I, never, I was never even asked to serve. But to see what an army of the Lord can do because of vision builders, because of DNA, because of you serving, I have ushers. I have a parking team. I mean, do you, deal, do you know what the parking team has to deal with, especially between services? You should be praying for our parking team. I see people that come in and they've been here a long time and then they learn sign language and it's not the fingers you should be doing. You know, it's like, did they just leave church? I thought that was a good message. Wow. Lasted 48 seconds, you know? It's like, my wife's petrified right now, you know? But it's like, pray for our parking team. I look at the people behind in the cafe, all volunteers taking our orders. We give better tips at Starbucks and they're not even doing kingdom business. Thinking to myself, I am so grateful for all the volunteers. I'm thankful for Kids Church. Honestly, I mean, we, they're not babysitting. They are empowering. They are doing radical things in our kids' ministry. I think of junior high. I think of high school camp. Yeah. I know adults that go to camp that have a job and they're dysfunctional for a month afterwards because they volunteered at camp. Do you know what it's like being at a camp with high schoolers? 600. 
600 high school. You come back. That's why I don't go anymore. <laughs> I can't afford to be down for three weeks. <laughs> like they beat me to the pulp. I mean, chiropractic business will go up, but that's not the right way to do it. <laughs> Listen, I want to read about this because I think it's really understand. I don't want to be the type of pastor that I just never was taught the revelation on Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to have a revelation. I'm going to drop three points, and then I want to pray for us today. But I want us to be in an empowered church. I want you to know how important this day is. And so we're going to read out of the book of Acts, the book of Action, written by Luke, uh, one of the disciples. He was the doctor. And so let's read Acts 1. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. Let me just paint the picture here. Some of us just don't read this scripture. I need you to put yourself in like you were back in the day. Jesus was crucified resurrected and then he hung out for 40 days with his disciples and word got out until a tribe of people were following him everywhere as he was doing good, walking in miracles, trying to teach, trying to put the last dot the I's, cross the T's for his disciples. Because how many know when he was crucified, they were a little shaken up? Yeah. yeah, well, if you didn't know that, the disciples were a little shaken up. Some of them quit, went back to menace, you know, fishing instead of ministry. But then Jesus, you know, came back. He's like, where's my tribe? They folded like a deck chair. All right, Lord, I need about a few more weeks. So 40 days he hung out. People started following him. Remember, he was just teaching them and talking to them. And you need to really see, what would you do? Put yourself in your shoes back in that time. What would you do if you were in this position? He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. You ready? Yes. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Somebody say wait. wait. This is very important. I want you to hear this. But wait for my gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days. How many days? A few days, thank you. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we've been teaching on it the last couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit on Wednesday nights. Pastor Jurgen, if you weren't here on Wednesday night, rip the roof off the place. Please, podcast, go to the website, get Pastor Jurgen. I mean, it was amazing. And it's hard, like if we're not all together getting synced up, it's hard to get this V8 moving in the right direction. And where there's unity... God commands a blessing. I just want us all to be in unity. So if you missed it, FOMO's a real thing. Don't get the spirit of FOMO on you. Just go get it. I need you to watch it, and let's move as a tribe together so we could be in synchronicity, so we could do radical things together. It was a great message. Uh, but he said, listen, then we would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. Somebody say power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, even San Diego, California. I added that last part. It don't says add to scripture, but that's just a commentary. I didn't add to scripture. I'm just saying it says to the end of the earth. I just want to let you know. This is where the end of the earth, now let's shine a light back out to the world. But I'm telling you, earlier he said, I want you to wait a few days because you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let me change it. But wait a few days because you'll be baptized with power. How many need some power in their life? Not all hands went up. That's interesting. Lord, give them revelation. We all need power. To live in this crazy world, we need power. See, the Holy Spirit isn't an it or a mystical force or a mystical power. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. See, it's amazing because we have a different thing. I was never really taught how important this was. So I'd be like, okay, I got the revelation, fear the Lord, fear God, I got God, he's... Then I got Jesus, I got that pretty down, but I was never taught on the Holy Spirit. I just thought it was this little mini me. 
So I never operated in the Holy Spirit, never even knew I need to. You go to Bible college, you do all these things. I'm like, how am I missing this? I come to awaken all of a sudden, like, Pentecost Sunday, we're getting filled with fire. Between services, Salt Lake City's freaking out because half their congregation got laid out in the power of God. They're having to pick people up on floors. I'm like, Lord, we're ready too. We're ready too. But he's not limited by time or space. The Holy Spirit is essential to the kingdom of God. That's why we're teaching on if we want a deep, intimate relationship with God, we have to know him by his spirit. And only the spirit knows and reveals thoughts, feelings, and purposes of God's heart. See, if we're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're not having the deep revelations we're called to have. We want to be baptized with power. And in this world, let me just tell you, I went 30 years with no power, spent about 16, 17 with power. You couldn't pay me to go back to the other side. If I want to walk in a hospital to pray for my friend that's called me to pray for him, how many know I want to walk in with power? How many know when someone calls me and they need breakthrough or a miracle, my dad's going through something right now, he doesn't need my intelligence, he needs power. The same things that Jesus did are the same things. If you pick up that power, you will and can too if we are picking up what he's trying to put down. So let me go after. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and on a cloud that hid them from their sight. All right, some of you missed that because I can't tell by your faces. <laughs> Jesus was with them and then you saw Jesus go up on a cloud. How many of you would just have a little bit like what's going on right now? <laughs> Thank you for being honest. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going up, probably thinking, OMG. <laughs> I'm glad Dr. Leo got that joke. <laughs> Thank you. That made me feel better. I missed that laugh, man. Anyways. So then guess what? As they're looking up and telling into the sky, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? I don't know. I would be too. They saw what they seemed to be tongues of fire. Oh, wait. Skip that verse. The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let me just tell you something. They're standing there one minute with Jesus. He's gone up on a cloud. Two men are like, hey, what's your problem? The Holy Spirit's about to come. Holy Spirit comes, lights up a room like this, except there's way too many of you. There was only 120 in that room. And they were standing in Jerusalem, listen, to them, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, the violent wind, by the way, they heard this sound, they came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is each of us hear them in our own native language? And it goes on to say all what their native languages were. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Somehow, or some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Listen, there was haters back then before IG, before Facebook, before TikTok. There's always been haters. But you know what I love about Peter? He didn't care about the haters. He got up and he said, hey, hey. Then Peter stood up with the 11. That was his boys. There's some big boys in here. I don't even need 11 of you. There's like two of you. I'm nervous. But Peter probably wasn't that yoked. There was not enough protein back then. So they just stood up. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> and this was before it was five o'clock somewhere. Glad some of you have a sense of humor. I feel better about my life. Thank you. Okay, so but listen, because Joel in the Old Testament said this, in the last days, somebody say last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
On all of us have the opportunity. We can pour out our spirit on all people, okay? Your young sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let me tell you something. For anybody not preaching on Pentecost Sunday, about Pentecost Sunday, we wonder what's going on in America is because of weak sauce Christianity. How many know we need power to do the work of the kingdom? And just so you know, on Pentecost Sunday, Peter just gave his first altar call. And it says, and thousands were added to the church. What did he do? Well, let's go to Matthew 28, 18. Come on, let's pull this up. This is what Jesus said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Well, I know 10 of them that we decided to take out of schools, take out of government, take out of in courthouses, take out so we don't teach the commands, even though the great commission, not the great suggestion, says, teach them what I've commanded them. Oh, let's just hide those, though. We don't want to offend anybody. teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. Listen, he knows we probably have a problem living up to it, so let's just teach him to observe. But guess what? We're taking them all down so no one can observe them. If you go ask the average person, they don't even know what the Ten Commandments are anymore. In the 1960s, everyone knew what they were. They might not have been living by them, but at least they were observing and trying to understand them. But here I am. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's what Jesus said. Here you have Peter getting up, piping off, saying, hey, this is what's going on. They're not drunk. They're speaking with power. That's the Holy Spirit did an altar call, and a 1,000 were added to the first church service ever. By the end of the day, there was 3,000. By the end of the week, there was 5,000. Obviously, now I'm not a good enough preacher like Peter because I still got chairs open. We've been open a year. I'm working on it. But what I love about it, let me tell you something. Numbers mean something in the Bible. Pentecost was exactly, and this is great information, 50 days after Easter. 50 days after Easter was Pentecost, today. It's the 50th day after Easter. It's Pentecost Sunday. You know what's so amazing? Seven, that's seven weeks, which means completion. 50 symbolizes deliverance, freedom from burdens. How many need to get some deliverance and freedom from burdens? Anybody got some burdens they want to get? Hey, let them go today. It's Pentecost Sunday. Let's get free of that stuff. It also means ju jubilee. Every 50 years was the year of jubilee, which all debts were settled in favor of the debtor. Slaves were granted freedom. Let me just tell you, if some of you need to get set free from some debts, just start getting some jubilee up in you. I'm just advancing. It's 50 days. That number 50 means something. Just know that it's just not random. But this is what I think is so fascinating. Remember, after the resurrection, Jesus walked the earth for how many days? 40 days. Crowds were following him as he was ascended to heaven on day 40, and Jesus told all his followers to what? Wait, Wait. Wait for just a few days. You know what bugs me? 10 days later, there was only 120 still waiting in the upper room for Pentecost Sunday. Here you have the Savior of the world that was raised with resurrection power, and he's giving instruction to wait to about 500 people, and yet only 10 days. And my question is, what the heck were they doing? Some of them are like, well, we waited a few days. Maybe, 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 I don't know. Maybe it was just a few too many. I'm thinking to myself, where are we at as a church? If you think about the number 10, 10 means test. Right. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. What's the tithe? It's 10%. Yep. It's just a test. Yeah. Right. What I love it is 120 people passed the first test. Wow. Wow. It's just amazing to think about. The number 10 equals test. They only had to wait a few days to receive power. Maybe they didn't think they were going to get full power. Maybe it was like Prius power, not Tesla power. <laughs> 
Too much? Too much? No, it's okay. You'll be fine. But listen, I love it because 40 days with Jesus, 10 days until Pentecost, and the, fi- the, the crowd shrunk from 500 to 120. 380 people talked each other into leaving. Wow. So 120 were baptized. They went out to share the gospel that day, and over 3,000 were added to the church in one day. It's amazing that the first chapters, the first 10 chapters of Acts, the church was fire. If anyone want to read something that gets you fired up, read about the early church, the book of Acts, the book of action. What were they doing? That same book of action is happening today, but where are we faith-wise? Where are we baptized in the Holy Spirit? Could you wait? Have you waited? Will you wait? What are you waiting for? Just makes me want to know what was their faith like? If I saw my Savior roll up in the cloud to heaven and he told me to wait, I'm just trying to think if I was in those shoes, what are we going to be like? So I'm just going to tell you straight up. I want to preach to a church that could wait 10 days for power. I want us to be believing enough, have enough faith that we're like, you know what? I'm believing for my miracle. What if you didn't get it after two days? Could you wait another? Could you wait another? I'm thinking to myself, I want us to be the church that can take this reality. If he told his disciples to wait, there were 500 people that saw these miracles and praying for people and people being raised from the dead and radical things were happening. You could see the holes in his hands, but yet he told you to wait because you're about to receive power. I'm thinking to myself, what else would it take? What type of church are we going to be? So I have three points real quick. Because faith is like a muscle and it's got to be worked out. So we're going to work out a faith muscle right now because I want this church to walk in power. Operating the gifts, all nine of them, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? When I start working out and I'm consistent with it, well, the theory is I'll get bigger. I mean, I was watching Andessa's videos. Have you seen her videos? Come on, I'm so proud. She is taking getting ready for marriage retreat to the next level. I'm like, my wife and I are watching. I'm like, turn that off. I mean, I can't even get down in a yoga position like that. I think I'm ripping things. Lindsay, why are you laughing? I got two weeks left. I'm going to look. Hey, listen, I'm taking the next two weeks very serious. Okay? You just wait and see. And I know some of you won't take it as serious as me, so you're not going to look as good as me, but that's the only reason. Because I'll know I'll not look as good as Andessa and James. Because there's no way I'm catching them at this point. My only hope is some of you just get addicted to donuts for the next two weeks. I'm going to be fine. It's going to be, what? There's nothing wrong with donuts. Just keep eating them before marriage retreat, all right? I need to feel, all right. Number point number one, find your faith. How do we find faith? When I came to this church, I got to tell you something. I heard Pentecost, baptism of the Holy Spirit, fire. I was like, oh, man, they're way too intense. And I was shaking to my core. What do I really believe about this? I did a deep dive. By the time year two came around, I'm like, okay, I'm hungry for Pentecost Sunday. By year three, I'm like, give me Pentecost Sunday. By year four, every Sunday is Pentecost Sunday at this point. You know what I mean? We don't have to wait once a year. Let's just operate in fire all the time. You can. I want people coming down the altar. We're going to pray for miracles. But the first thing we got to do as a church is find your faith. Where's your faith? Where's it at today? How are you, how are you dealing with this? The title of my message is Flex Your Faith. Well, it kind of went over kind of quiet. <laughs> or Faith Flex. Number one, find your faith. How do you find faith increasing or find it at all? Find it at all. Listen, all in. We got to renew our mind. We got to believe again. See, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible warns us that there is a devourer that wants to steal faith from you. I just say we leak faith. You know, it's like how you do anything is how you do everything. One thing you're not going to find in this This pulpit, poverty poverty in the pulpit is poverty in the people. So therefore, we're breaking poverty mentality. You got to know that God came to bless you, to get you to think different. And so if you're stuck in some limited beliefs around your money circumstances, you're not believing what Matthew says, that with God, all things are possible. 
We got to believe and find your faith again. Whether it's in finances, find your faith in healing, find faith in your marriage can be restored, find faith that your kids can love Jesus, find faith that the economy is gonna be okay, find faith that Tremino's gonna get in, find faith to something, you know what I mean? We just gotta find some faith. It says in John 14, 12, very truly I tell you, whatever, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to my father. He's saying, hey, I'm out of here. I have to entrust this thing, the gospel, the good news. I'm giving it to you, my kids. So you go live it, not just think about it. You live it. You operate in it. You walk in power. Greater things than Jesus, the greatest man that ever lived. We're really gonna do that? I've seen it happen here. Because you are empowered. You are empowered to do big things. We can't just live this comfortable Christianity. What does that even mean? How can we do greater things than Jesus? See, Jesus isn't calling us to be greater than he is. He's calling us to be greater with him through his spirit within us. When you're operating with power, you're operating with the Holy Spirit in you. The thing is, most of us are not in imminent danger of ruining our lives. I believe the danger is great, far greater than that because we're wasting them. When we sit around and not use this power that's been bestowed, that's been given to us, we are wasting the gift on our life. You know, I worry about the risk for myself and maybe you feel the same way. We've had some big dreams about what God, God might want for our lives, but so many of us are stuck in the starting blocks. Where are we at today? Maybe we're dragging our feet because we carry so much baggage. Maybe we're just moving at a snail's place. Maybe we're stuck somewhere, but we serve a God with unlimited power. He believes in you. He's giving you a dream. He wants you to do something. We can't be like that mannequin, the motionless man on Pier 39. We got to move. You got to chase it. We were meant for more. We can't settle for less. Baseline living in this house is not okay for a believer in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus and you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have a power that the world needs to see you operate in. But what happens is there is a devil that tries to get you into Christian complacency. And I'm gonna tell you, you gotta rage. There's a price to pay for Christian complacency. If this church was in Christian complacency, we wouldn't be looking after four orphanages. We wouldn't have 600 kids in Peru. We wouldn't have these campuses that every weekend, altars are open and lives are changed. We wouldn't have awakened recovery where people are getting set free. We wouldn't have pastoral care and marriage ministries and marriage getaway where we're gonna have 500 couples that are gonna get their minds blown, that they're gonna believe again, that they can have fun, live this epic marriage, be a light to the world. They can come back and impact. Today, our El Cajon campus in the middle of Second Street is open. I'm looking at the pictures. It is right in the middle of the, it used to be a homeless camp and all these homeless people lived in the Vons that we bought, took over, and today, resurrection power. It's an altar, and I guarantee lives are getting altered today. That's a church that believes in what the Bible says, that we're gonna receive power. I've seen it. Christian complacency looks like this. It looks cynical, critical, and judgmental. If you keep living on this level, your heart's gonna shrivel. I'm a lyrical gangster, I know, thank you. <laughs> Listen, your dreams are too begin to die. I don't want anyone in this house to be on life support spiritually. I was raised that way and I'm bold as, and it's not the fault of my parents. What do you know? I had a Bible believing church that was just preaching some of it, not all of it. When you preach on the Holy Spirit, I don't know what's gonna happen when I do an altar call and people start getting prayed for. You know, stuff happens. It's not my job to control what the Holy Spirit wants to do. 
My job is create the atmosphere and empower you to be so hungry you're gonna run, let down your guard, and let God heal your heart. Number two, test your faith. I better preach fast. How do you test your faith? Do you live in the gap or the gain? Meaning, I know a lot of you, you're setting a goal, you, you know, if it's zero to 30, you set a goal for 30 and you hit 22 and you're so busy judging yourself for the eight that you missed, you forget to celebrate the 22 that you nailed. What has God done in your life in the last three months, six months, nine months? Sure, we wanna be over here. But listen, some of you came into this church, you couldn't even lift your hand and worship. Now you got double trouble. Some of you came into men's prayer and you didn't say a word, but now you're coming to men's prayer, you're roaring like a lion. Some of you would never pray for any other person because you don't even know how to pray for yourself and now you're laying hands on them. That is how you test your faith. Some of you know how to pray and didn't. Some of you have never tithed before, but you came here and you're like, man, I'm gonna tithe. That's called testing your faith. God talks about it in Malachi, test me in this. That's how you test your faith. What do I really believe? You gotta start believing again. How do you be bold and courageous? You show up. I know it's not easy, but don't tell me it's not possible. Matthew 19, 26 talks about, but Jesus looked at his boys and he says, hey, you're right, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You either believe that scripture or you don't. If you are with God, and you have power, I need you to let the penny drop. All things are possible to those that believe. So help your belief today. Maybe pray to God, help my unbelief. God's more interested in total obedience than he is in your total understanding. You might not have full understanding. I didn't. You know what I did though? I was offended, but I kept showing up. I was taught one way my whole life and this theology was messing me up. I didn't understand it, but I was obedient. I tied when I didn't understand. Now I understand. Thank goodness I was just obedient because now I got full revelation on it. And what's funny about being in Vision Builders, right when I started tithing, the next month was Vision Builders. I'm like, whoa, whoa, slow it down, Pastor Jurgen. I just got tithing. Now you want this Vision Builders thing? I barely got vision for tithing. But since I saw what God would do with that, I was just, all right, I'm gonna commit something. And to see what something turned into, I will never miss Vision Builders. Matter of fact, I almost look, I, the first month, January of every year, when we do Shredder Sunday and Vision Sunday and Freedom Sunday, man, it's, my, it's one of my favorites. And then when we get to Vision Builder Month, it's like, mm, let's go. We're advancing the kingdom. I'm stretching myself. I'm getting nervous. I'm, Lord, what kind of number are you gonna give me? That's way too big. And then all of a sudden, all things are possible. Ah, I hate that verse. I loved that verse last week when I preached on Pentecost. Now I don't like it. Listen, there's a couple areas we can get stuck in. If you start thinking, well, it's good enough. Good enough thinking is baseline living marked by mediocrity, being stuck in spiritual survival mode and being controlled by complacency. If you're complacent with your relationship with Christ, I got to get you to break free. That's when you do things you've never seen yourself do. When I say altar call and you need some breakthrough, you run to the altar call. When we do the book of miracles and you need to shift some thinking, that's when you raise a hand up and you don't care who comes pray for you. That's when you break out of being comfortable. If you're comfortable, you're complacent, the devil's stealing your joy and you're stuck, not operating in power. Good isn't good enough. The next one is greatness. Well, I think I'm, I think, no, greatness is vague. It's unrealistic. It's aspirations of doing better that don't work in real life. Good enough leaves you stuck in stagnation and greatness leads you to endless frustration. Hello. Where I need you to live is be greater. You're gonna do greater things, says the Lord. That's Bible. Greater is Bible. The life altering understanding that God is ready to accomplish a kind of greatness in your life. How does God teach faith? How does he test faith? Through two ways, surrender and trust. When you surrender your ways and you trust God, this will lead you to vision and generosity. If you can trust and surrender, you'll get vision and generosity. But if you can't do those first two things, you'll never walk in vision and generosity. 
Listen, I just want to simply ask in this moment, and you could ask the Lord just to begin to open your eyes by faith so you can perceive where you're at. Just locate your heart. Say, God, where am I today? What do I believe about this? Am I operating in power? If you've got a six beat, are you stuck in first? Are you stuck in third? What does six speed look like? Maybe some of you are operating six speed. You know that if you are, he'll give you a seven speed, an eight speed. There's no ceiling on what God can do. He's just trying to get you to move so you can trust him more. When you get to that next level, he'll give you another bigger thing to trust. Trust me, I know. Huh. People say, how do you do all that? I don't know, only Jesus. Amen. You gotta open up your imagination to the possibility that God has a vision for your life that's greater. How do you do it? Point number three, flex your faith. How do you flex your faith? There's three C's. You ready for them? The confidence to know that nothing's impossible with him. The clarity to see the next step he's calling you to take and the courage to do anything he tells you to do. It takes confidence, clarity, and courage. Confidence, clarity, and courage. Build that muscle, flex that faith of confidence, clarity, and courage. God's greater vision for your life isn't based on a formula. It's built on a promise called the word of God. God created you for more. Pentecost Sunday, so you get power, so you can believe in more. He's never gonna put anything on your plate that you can't handle. You'll be inspired to dream bigger but you also be challenged to start smaller. It's the simple steps of radical obedience where I've seen my life flourish. It's the little things. I just got challenged this week. I met this guy through a patient of mine that next thing I know, I invited him to my house before I asked my wife. <laughs> that flies out from Tennessee because God, in the middle of a prayer meeting, told him, move to California. So with a word, he took a step and just came out here. He met, spent a couple days with me, and he thought he was going to this other church, blah, blah, blah. He didn't even know. But he just trusted God enough to say, okay. So he flew out here. Stayed with me as they came to Wednesday night service, heard Pastor Jurgen just got mine. She went to women's prayer, mine. Just saying, wow, we were thinking one thing, but God's now... See, they, they did the obedience thing of came out to California just to see what God was going to do. God will direct your steps, but then they got all intellectual and started thinking, okay, logic. Okay, we, I guess we'll be going here. We'll be, no, it met me. And then now guess what? How many know God's got other plans? His ways are not our ways. Let's stop trying to tell God our ways to make us feel better and comfortable about our life. He's trying to get you uncomfortable, do radical things. He wants you to lay hands on the sick. Some of us haven't even done that yet, but it doesn't matter where you're at. It matters where you're going. We got to dream big, but start small. Yeah. Lay hands on yourself and pray for your own healing. Maybe come down the altar, let someone pray for you. Take that impartation and pray for somebody else. Maybe it's call somebody today and leave them a voice memo and pray for them. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm going to pray right now. And then pray for them. Send them a voice memo of prayer. Do you know that's how it started for me? God would highlight a person and I just would have to get the courage. And I'd call him, I'd be like, don't answer, don't answer. Oh, they didn't answer. Okay. <laughs> and then I'd pray for him, leave him a message. But then I got to the point where I wanted them to answer. See, I had to start small. Now it's like, start giving me names, Lord. If he'll do it for me, he's gonna do it for you. Listen, surrendering leads to trusting, which leads to catching a vision. The biggest thing is walking by faith. Can you walk on one word? Peter did. Matthew 14, 90, 19, Jesus said one thing to Peter. You know the word he said? Come. Can you stand on one word? What if that one word was stay? Stay in a marriage. What if it was provide? I will provide for you. What if it's give? What if it's forgive, turn the other cheek? What if it's a specific amount for vision builders? God, how will I do it? He didn't ask you. 
the how. He's just wanted, Peter didn't ask any questions. He just said, come. You know what Peter did? He didn't ask how. He didn't do anything. He got out of that boat and started taking a step. He got some steps, and then he started going, I can't do this. And you're right, he couldn't. But if God can give you one word, and you can flex that face. What if it's starting small? What's one thing you're going to do today? Listen, I read my Bible app. I wish they'd tell me how many days I completed and tell me how many days I missed. That ticks me off. I've already sent in a complaint. They're living in the gap, not the gain. I'm trying to get them to switch their mentality, but I just want to tell you, can we surrender some stuff to God today? Can you receive power today and believe God for radical things? If we could all stand to our feet, I want to pray for us. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for two groups of people. Number one is an impartation. If you need, if you feel like you're stuck in Christian complacency, or maybe you're like, I've been stuck in greatness, but I want to be greater. The Bible's about you being greater. That's for you. Just raise your hands as I pray. Some things are taught, some things are caught, and I want you to catch an impartation to shift some thinking, limited beliefs, knowing that God wants you to do some radical things. You might be saying, I'm already doing radical things. Well, there's more to do. We got a city that needs us. We got a state that needs us. We got a nation that needs to know what righteousness looks like. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you today on Pentecost Sunday. God, we want to be the church that waits. Not just for a few days. We'll wait the full 10, Lord. God, I thank you, Lord, that you've tested awakened. God, that you've tested our pastors. God, they're faithful. Thank you for their righteousness. But God, we thank you for an impartation of power today. Holy Spirit, just touch those hands that are lifted. Let there be an impartation so we can see greater. We can do greater. We can operate greater. We can play bigger, impact greater. We can change a city, a neighborhood, a house, Lord. We can change destiny's lives. I thank you for our kids that are finding boldness to be courageous in the sight of wickedness in a world, they will not be afraid for you are with us. So God, we impart your Holy Spirit today. Let us be hungry to say yes to the promises which are yes and amen. God, I thank you for some of the greatest leaders coming out of this house. I thank you for some of the greatest business minds, those that are willing to take dreams off a shelf and put them into reality because they're trusting you again. Lord, I thank you for those hearts that have been broken. Lord, let them be healed today. God, I thank you, Lord. We surrender our heart to you. You're a good, good father. Lord, and as we surrender our heart to you, you heal those things that are hurt, those splinters that maybe have, are still in there where we're holding on to some bitterness or some trust that we've lost with people. People are messy, Lord, but you are great. And Lord, I thank you for that supernatural healing today. I thank you, Lord, that we believe that we can all receive your Holy Spirit, that we will operate in all nine gifts, not just the fruit of the Spirit to bring balance to our lives, but we're going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, to bring power to a hurting world. God, let them see your power to make your name famous. We thank you today. And everybody said, Amen. Listen, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, the last thing I'm going to do, listen, it's one thing to come to church. It's one thing to say, oh, I'm Protestant, I'm Catholic, I'm, I'm whatever. This is not about a religion. This is about a relationship with Jesus. See, God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for you and I. And I want to let you know that it's a free gift, but we have to receive that free gift. It says we were born into a sinful world, and yet when we accept Jesus into our life, we're a new creation. Let me just tell you something. I still get different revelations all the time, and I've been a Christian this many years. We need to say, Jesus, I want you in my heart. Renew me. You will be born again. And when you're born again, like my wife said, it's a new bloodline. It's called eternity. See, we are spirits living a physical experience here on earth, but one day when Jesus returns, guess what? He's gonna take every one of us to heaven that have a relationship with him. This isn't about fear or condemnation. This is about a gift that he wants you to receive and it's free. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't just be good enough. Your parents can't say, oh, they're on my, on my Jesus train. 
No, it's a personal decision. When you just say, that's it, I wanna give my heart to Jesus and it's super easy. So if that's you today with every head bowed and every eyes closed, just to respect them. Listen, if you want to say, I wanna receive Jesus, I want Jesus in my heart, I'm gonna say a prayer for you, but I just want you to lift your hand. If you could just lift your hand right now. Say, I want Jesus in my heart. Thank you, sweetie, I see your hand. I see your hand up there, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, I see your hand up there. I see your hand right here. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you, I see your hand up top. Beautiful. I see your hand over here. Listen, it's so important. I see your hand way up there. Thank you for that. Raising your hand doesn't get you in heaven. It's a confession of your heart. So as one church, I know many of us have said this same prayer. It's a heart decision. We're gonna say it as one church. You guys could all look up. There's lots of hands everywhere. I have some ladies down here. I have my man of valor right here, John up here. I got people all over. We have two gifts. We have a Bible and a following Jesus book. We wanna give those to you. I have a response lounge over there. I'm gonna change it to party lounge because the Bible says that there is a party in heaven if one person gives their life to Christ. So today, Today, I don't know, response sounded very like Christianese, but now it bothers me. That right there is my party lounge. So we want to party with you if you raise your hand. That means we want to pray for you. We want to celebrate. We want to give you gifts. If you're like, man, if I knew they were giving away gifts and a free party, I would have raised my hand. Uh, listen, you can still go to the, the response lounge, party lounge, because it's so important to let my team, one of my team members look after you, pray for you. Let's say this prayer there all together. You with me? Yeah. Okay, here we go for some of those that are excited. Come on. That's a big deal. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. Today, I repent. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that my eternity is secure. Thank you for loving me, showing me that the rest of my life can be the best of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.